Good morning. It's good to see uh, so many of you out uh, back from a trip on vacation or healing from sickness or visiting from other churches. We're thankful that you're here. It's always cool to see uh, people visiting out during times like this. And so uh, it warms our heart. We hope that you can uh, hang around a little bit after uh, the service out in the uh, not the foyer area, whatever that is out there, that little canopy thing. I'm, I'm losing the word right now, <laughs> as I often do. Uh, but just hang out in the open air anyway and get to know us a little bit better so we can get to know you. Um, and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited because I, I've begun to hear, like many of you, the whisper of fall. Have you guys felt that whisper this past week? Uh, it's not quite here yet, but I'm super excited about all the things that that foretells pumpkin this, pumpkin that, pumpkin latte, pumpkin carving, pumpkin this. And uh, it's, it's super exciting to me anyway. So, uh, and, but I was thinking the other day, you know, wasn't it like just like fall not too long ago? I mean, thank you 2020, right? Uh, man, it's gone by really quickly. So, uh, but it's exciting anyway. So, um, we are in the middle of our series, Read Jesus, and uh, you guys have been, many of you guys are the same faces we've been seeing throughout the entire service, or maybe you've been tuning online uh, through the live stream, and uh, you know this series has been foundational for some of the things that Mike and I want to talk about here in the future, but it's really foundational to our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ, and it's all been about recalibrating the view that we have of the Messiah. That if we do not have a proper view of the Lord Jesus that we're supposed to be following, nothing else is going to be right. And so we've talked about Jesus bringing the kingdom of God. We've talked about him being devoted to the scriptures and to prayer. We've talked about his life being dedicated towards fighting the toxic religion that we see in his day and also pursuing the marginalized. And then we talked about last week, Mike presented a lesson about one of the parables which really describe the essence of Jesus' ministry in the parable we come to refer to as the Good Samaritan parable. And today, I'm going to talk about another parable that really encapsulates another portion of Jesus' ministry. And it is a parable in which Jesus tells us, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's today's topic. Now, why are we going to talk about that? Why that specific issue in all of these big topic issues over the series of Jesus? Well, I want to show you. Go ahead and open your Bible, if you would, to Luke chapter 8, okay? Check this text out, Luke chapter 8. And uh, I'm reading from the ESV version, but we're going to start reading in verse 4 of Luke chapter 8. I want to show you why. Luke chapter 8, verse 4. And I'm reading from the ESV. It says there, and when a great crowd was gathering and people from town to town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into the good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We'll just go ahead and stop there. We'll extend the Lord's invitation now. If uh, you've never obeyed the gospel or put on the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism, uh, we'll go ahead and have you baptized now for the forgiveness of your sins. Relax, I'm joking. <laughs> We're not going to extend the invitation at this point. But what if I did do that? What if we just stopped the sermon right there and we just extended the invitation and called it quits at that point? I can imagine what the response would be. I can imagine at the end of the service, as I'm standing in the foyer or out underneath the canopy out there, some of you guys would come to me and you would say, that was kind of strange, Tyler. How about you explain to me what's going on there? But probably most of you would just shrug and say, I don't know, you just had a, you know, it's not, not every sermon's a win. <laughs> and go on your way and get your lunch afterwards, right? And that is exactly what Jesus does. After he's healed people, after he's, you know, begun his ministry for some time now, 
He pushes out in a boat, in other accounts it says, and he tells the story about the sower. And that's where he ends it. Right there, it's done. With people left scratching their heads. Why does he do that? Like most prophets before him, Jesus' teaching divides the people. When his message was received by some, understood by some, sought and loved by some, but rejected by most. The reason why we're addressing this parable, along with the other one, in this series on Re-Jesus is because the biblical Jesus puts the onus on us to understand what he says. He puts the burden, he puts the responsibility on us to really hear what he has to say. This is Jesus' way of saying, are you watching closely? Do you see what I'm doing? Have you really understood the biblical Jesus in this series? And so all of us, I want you to view this lesson as sort of a breath in. Okay, it's an interlude. It's a time to pause and, and, and kind of think about and ponder all the topics we discuss about this biblical Jesus, this recentering on the biblical Jesus. And we know it's the point because if you look at this parable in Luke chapter 8, what you notice is that there's a word that's repeated over and over again. Now, I've told my Bible students before, if you want to know the theme of a story, if you want to know the point of a biblical passage, one of the tricks that the biblical authors will use is that they will repeat a word, a phrase, a motif to show you this is the point of what I'm saying. The word here is repeated no less than nine times in this section. It's obnoxious, really, almost as obnoxious as the size of that font on the wall there, okay? Let us see what he has to say. This parable, I don't know when the last time you heard a lesson on it was or the last time you read about it. This parable is not about the sower. It's not about the seed. It's about the soils. And I want to point this out as we go through this text together. Go ahead and uh, your Bible's already turned there, hopefully, Luke chapter 8. We're going to read it in its entirety there, beginning in verse 4, okay? Let's try this one more time. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town to town came to him, he said to them in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into the good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out and he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said to him, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And the words uh, and those the, one, the ones along the path, excuse me, are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root; they believe for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast and honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care then how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are here standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And this is... The word of the Lord. Now, very simple today. Uh, just want to walk through the text with you, right? So let's go ahead and bow our heads together as we go to God in prayer, and then we'll walk through the text together. Almighty God in heaven, we're thankful 
for the text that we have before us. And as we know that you are the great giver of the word and your word has been promised not to return to you void, we ask that that word would be cast deeply into the soil of our hearts and that, Father, that word might enlighten us, might not make us dull, but might open our eyes to be enlightened, to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be moved to render our obedience and our allegiance to him. Father, may you prep and nurture the soil of our hearts now as we seek to humbly obey your word. We pray in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, so the first thing I want us to pay attention to as we just walk through this text together is the very first thing that Luke uh, permits for us to see in there in verses 9 and 10, okay? I'm going to throw on the board for your convenience, but Luke is trying to point out in Jesus' teaching, he gives a reason for his parables, okay? He gives a reason for his teaching in the way that he does. Um, And this is something important because not only do we learn things from Jesus explicitly based on things he just does objectively around us or in the story, but there's implicit teachings. Why does he do what he does? And I can't tell you how many times I heard that a parable is only there meant to enlighten things. Look how great of a storyteller Jesus is, and he was, but look how great of a storyteller Jesus is. He always tells stories to help us understand some bigger concepts. Well, yes and no. First of all, what is a parable? A parable is not just some earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A parable is simply a comparison that's been elongated to a story form, to a narrative form. That's all a parable is. It's an analogy that has been grown into a story, okay? And what he does here is he explains why he teaches in parables. And the reasoning is complicated. I don't know if you saw this, but at the tail end of verse um, 10 there, he's quoting a passage. And we know this passage is an allusion to Isaiah chapter 6. If you want to understand the purpose for why he taught in parables, you have to understand a little bit about Isaiah's calling in Isaiah chapter 6. Now, what happens is, is after indicting Israel in Isaiah 1 through 5, in chapter 6, Isaiah receives a vision from God where he sees the Lord high and lifted up in the year that King Uzziah died. And that's where the angels are saying, you know, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And we have the whole incident where the firebrand is put on his lips and he's clean. And the Lord asks, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And then he tells them the nature of his mission. Isaiah, when you go to these people, I want you to say, keep on seeing, but never understand. Keep on hearing, but never perceive. Make the hearts of these people dull, right? So that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. What he's explaining about Isaiah's ministry is that your ministry is not just going to save a remnant Isaiah, Your ministry is going to condemn the majority that they may rest in that judgment that I am bringing upon Israel, that judgment of exile. That's what your ministry, your your, your sermons are going to have this doling effect, not just a saving effect, but a doling effect on most of the individuals who are going to reject you and by and large reject me. We're told Jesus' ministry has the same effect that the same thing is happening in his own ministry, that they are going to be rendered blind, deaf, and dumb like the idols that they swear allegiance to. See Psalm 115 for more information on that. But that's what's happening here. Jesus' ministry is like that. I heard it put it this way. The same sun that melts butter hardens clay. It just depends on the material you're made out of, right? The kind of soul you are, the sort of hearer that you are. Now, the question we should be asking at this point, which one am I? What kind of listener, hearer, am I? Well, notice what happens in verse 9. Who are the ones who didn't walk away from his parable scratching their heads and thinking Jesus has lost his marbles? It's the ones in verse 9 who went to him later and asked them. The ones who clung to him. His disciples who later said, hey, you know that weird story you just told that you didn't give any sort of information about, any sort of key, code? What was that about? And they are the ones who are enlightened, the ones who follow them, the ones who are curious and hungry. What is our posture as hearers? 
What kind of people are we? Now, we're going to transition a little bit and elaborate on the type of hearers that we are as we move on to the next part in verses 11 through 15. So looking at your Bibles there, chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. Now, remember, this, this sermon is sort of serving as an interlude in the middle of the series. Okay, It's a way to take a step back and, and just briefly do a heart check for a moment. Okay, Meditate on this parable as we know it. Now, what I've done in the past is not what I'm going to do now. What I've done in the past is typically I have taken the path, the seed sown on the path, the seed sown on the rock, the seed sown on the thorns, and the seed sown on the good soil. And I've just talked about different examples of what that might mean. Okay? I actually don't think you need me to do that for you. I trust you as hearers. Because this is relative to your position in life right now. You're going to read what the path might be in your particular life. I don't need to tell you what that's like in my life. So just take this moment. I want to encourage you to take this moment and really think about which soil are we? Now, you might have always assumed which soil it is that you struggled with in the past. Maybe the last time you heard the sermon on this text. Maybe the last time we read this text in our daily Bible reading. But I'm asking today, what soil are you? And if the truth is is to be told, I can probably say that uh, it's been our experience to be all of these soils at one time or another, hasn't it? But which one do we lean towards? What we see whenever we break up the soils here is that basically the way it can be broken up is 25% are unreceptive. They're the ones in verse 15 that are on the path, right? As soon as the soil, as soon as the seed is being cast there, it's gobbled up like that. It's like this bird that comes down and takes it away. 25% is shallow reception. The soil isn't deep enough. It's there for a little bit. It springs up, but the sun scorches it and it dies. Times of temptations, coming to God with various agendas, suffering, whatever it might be. 25% there is temporary reception. These are people who, the soil really sprung, the seed broke open and began to develop, but it didn't go to maturity. Why? Because some parasite, because some vine, because some leech, because some thorn, some weed or something is drawing the nutrients away from the soil and away from this thing so it can never bring that fruit quite to maturity. Something is in its life that's distracting it from bearing fruit. And then lastly... 25% roughly, is good reception. They've heard. They can hear. It's good soil. Verse 20, they bear fruit with patience. We all have to do a heart check and to see based on the series and what we've heard about Jesus, about the biblical Jesus, about re-Jesus, where are we? Now, luckily for us, he actually gives us a uh, a barometer, a a standard by which to test what sort of hearing we have. Because he goes on to elaborate in verses 16 through 18, check this out. So I can't tell you how many times I read the Bible and I saw this as being separate from Luke's focus in Luke chapter 8 and the story of the parable of the sower. Um, But notice how he elaborates on this good type of fruit-bearing hearing in verses 16 through 18. He says here that right now my teaching essentially is going to be hidden It's going to be more exclusive to my close following disciples. But there's coming a day when it's not going to be like that. When Peter, James, and John, and all the rest of the apostles, when you guys are going to take what I've taught you, and you're going to declare it on the rooftops, and you're going to bring it to the furthest reaches of the earth, and it's going to spread everywhere, because no one, after lighting a lamp, hides it under a basket. You have to share what you have learned about the Lord Jesus. And by extension... We as disciples can ask ourselves, have we shared what we have learned? Is the word touching us to the point that we have to tell somebody about it? The seed sown in our hearts that Jesus is king, that we need to be allegiant to him, that he is bringing the gospel of the kingdom. Have we shared that in whatever way we find ourselves sharing that in our daily lives? Otherwise, notice his warning, okay? Otherwise, notice what he says in verse 18. He says, take care then how you hear. 
For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. That's a very shrewd principle. What he's saying is basically that saying of, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? You've heard that before. Now, do you notice that he's already showed us that in this parable of the soils? Notice what happens first to the one sown on the path. They thought they had it, but the bird comes down and takes it. The one sown on the rock, they thought they had it, but the sun comes up and scorches it. The one sown in the thorns, they thought they had it, but the thorns come in, the weeds come in and deplete the energy and cause it never to ripen. They thought they had it, but it was taken away. And he warns, but to those who really have, more will be given, even bearing a hundredfold. And that's Jesus' promise for us if we allow it to nestle in the deep soil. So the first thing is sharing it. That's a barometer. The second thing we have is obeying it. Luke chapter 8, verses 19 to 21. Now, I don't know if, if we can appreciate how startling this message would have been, but Mark chapter 3 actually gives us a little more context for what's happening here. Jesus is teaching in a room and his mothers and his brothers come to him, and they think that he has lost his mind, okay? There's this Jewish fella from Nazareth who's going around telling people he's God's Messiah. He must be out of his mind. And when your mom thinks you're crazy, you, <laughs> you must be crazy, right? So they come in here, and, and, she, and, and we're even told Jesus' brothers don't believe him at this point. And they come in here, they tell him, hey, get out of here. Now, his whole room is filled with people who want to hear him. His family's on the outside. And Jesus, in this shame and honor society where family is chief among all things, it's a very traditional society, he has the audacity to say, do you want to know who my mother and brothers are? Do you want to know who I call family? Those who hear the word of God and do it. It's not just theory. It's not just what's happening here where you... You come together and you hear a sermon or you have a Bible class. It's not just tuning into a podcast every once in a while. It's not just reading a book by your favorite spiritual author or picking up the bestseller from the Barnes and Noble section with your mask on, of course. But it's doing it. It's obeying it. It's where all this book knowledge that you have finally becomes something that, that you intuit because you've done it so much and that muscle memory has taken over and you're living like the Lord Jesus, the re-Jesus, the Jesus that we see is the biblical Jesus in the Bible, following him, emulating him, living his life. So we can say, like the Apostle Paul, to live is Christ. This sermon is a heart check. Are you watching closely? What have we been told about Jesus? We have been told that Jesus was devoted to the scriptures. And Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We have been told Jesus brings the kingdom, preaches the kingdom. And Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is devoted to the scriptures. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus pursued the marginalized. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus fought toxic religion. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus tells us to be like the Samaritan and go and do likewise, loving our neighbor as ourselves. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. Jesus gives the word of God. And that word is indomitable. Now, I'm going to show you something else I learned this week that I didn't notice before. I used to think that this whole story of the sower ended at verse 15. And then I grew in my understanding and realized, no, the explanation about the lamp under the jar in verses 16 through 18, the story about his mother and brothers in 19 and 20, that's all connected too. You know what else I didn't notice? Read the rest of Luke chapter 8. What do we see about that indomitable word of God? What we witness there, brothers and sisters, is that that word has the power to still storms, is that that word is casting out demons, is that that word is raising the dead back to life. Jesus' word, Jesus himself is a walking embodiment of a passage we can read about in Isaiah 55. 
Turn there with me real quick in your Bibles, if you would. But I want to show you this. I want your own eyes to see this. Isaiah 55, I want you to see that everything that Isaiah prophesied and foretold is coming to embodiment and liveliness in this Jesus of Nazareth. Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 6. I really just want you to drink this in, okay? This is, this is very special. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that the Lord may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Because you're going to go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth in the singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. God keeps his promises. That's what we're seeing in the power of Jesus' word when he came and what he can accomplish even today through that seed. But do we hear? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you're not a Christian this morning, for real this time, if you're not a Christian this morning and you want to obey the gospel by rendering your allegiance to the Lord Jesus, if you want to be baptized in the water for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're allowing that seed to be cast into your heart and you're going to try to obey, you're going to follow the Lord Jesus, we want to help you in that journey in any way that we can. And if you are a Christian and you need the prayers of the church, we want to huddle around you and pray for you and, and, and enable you and help you and pray for you and, and encourage you. If you have anything, a need whatsoever, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing this song for your encouragement.